one of the biggest questions that we face when we're talking about art uh, is the question of what is art. And in order to determine what is and what's not, we have to set a definition. Now, sometimes people will say everything is art. And I don't really think that's true. In a way, if everything is art, then, then nothing is. It doesn't have that special aspect to it uh, that we think of when we think of the term art. The textbook has a pretty good definition uh, of art. So for the remainder of the course, we may reference that uh, to try to talk about what artwork is and what it isn't. And according to the textbook, uh, a work of art is the visual expression of an idea or experience formed with skill through the use of a medium. When it comes to the question of what is art and what is not, what most people will agree on uh, we call fine art or high art. And what would fall into that category, for example, uh, is the Mona Lisa painted by Leonardo da Vinci. I almost said Leonardo DiCaprio, but that's not right. Uh, it's Leonardo da Vinci, um, who's a painter working in Italy during what we call the High Renaissance. This fine art or high art uh, is appreciated not just because of its physical beauty, but because of the idea that uh, it communicates something about humanity and the idea that it does it in a, a very elegant and sophisticated way. So when you go to a museum and you see pieces like the Mona Lisa, um, you're seeing something that's really celebrated and it's considered priceless uh, and irreplaceable as a part of human history and, and of course, as uh, fine art. When we get into later chapters of the book, we're going to be talking about different artistic mediums, uh, which means different materials that are used to make art. That changed a lot in the 20th century. Uh, now, many artists are using what are typically unconventional materials to create things that are considered artwork. Really new concept. Uh, if you go back before the 20th century, art is basically defined by its medium. So if something was going to be a piece of artwork, then it was going to be uh, painted with a certain type of paint. It was going to be carved out of stone. It was going to be cast in bronze. Uh, and anything else would not fall into the same category. 20th century artists like Romare Bearden uh, helped change the idea of what can be considered art and what type of mediums can be used. Uh, through a technique like collage, he's creating the, these images that are, are very lively and, and very relevant to the area in which he grew up and in which he lived his life. So he's not just making that connection through the content of the artwork, uh, the materials itself that he uses to create this or things from his environment, like um, things from magazines, things from newspapers, things that he may have encountered in his everyday life. Many of the artists that we're going to look at and study in class are trained artists. So uh, at some point in their life, they were trained to do art. And that might mean that they went to a, a private art school or when they graduated, they went to a, a, an art college or a university. We've got art majors at Radford University that are trained artists. And when they graduate, uh, they have that skill set. We also are going to look at work by untrained artists, and sometimes these are referred to as outsider artists with the idea that they're outside of the academic system. Um, like any type of training in an academic program, uh, you tend to learn in a certain way and in a certain direction. Sometimes it's referred to as classical training, and if you're outside of that academic system, then you might have a different set of visual values and you might have a different way of doing things. Uh, sometimes referred to as outsider artists, also folk artists. To me, the term folk artist seems a little insulting. Like um, if to call someone a folk artist, to me, it sounds like you're putting their art on a lower level than someone who's classically trained. But there are some people that would be considered outsider artists that are very influential uh, and are doing some really good work. A great example of art by an outsider artist or an untrained artist would be what are sometimes referred to as the Watts Towers uh, near Los Angeles. And 
The Watts Towers were built uh, by an immigrant to America named Simon Rodia, and uh, the way he built the towers is by collecting refuse, um, trash or litter that he found lying on the street that he decided that he wanted to make into something beautiful. So he spent close to 30 years working on these towers, and it's become quite an attraction, and it's a pretty amazing piece. So as a person who doesn't have any formal training as an artist, it had a real effect uh, on his community by building these very impressive towers. I'll include a link uh, in another D2L entry that you guys can check out uh, a little about Simon Rodia. Another intriguing example of outsider art uh, was created by a person that was never identified that was simply referred to as the Philadelphia Wireman. It's not even known uh, whether or not it was a man or a male. People assume it was a male that created these objects because uh, they were wrapped with wire, and it seems like it would have taken a lot of hand strength to do that. But uh, it certainly could have been created by a female. Nobody knows who made it. These sculptures were found uh, in trash. And what really made them intriguing was that there were many, many sculptures that were done in the same style. And the style seemed to involve uh, some sort of artistic sophistication, even though it is uh, believed that it was done by an untrained artist, because to anyone's knowledge, there was never a exhibition of this work. And that's something that artists tend to do is to show their work. Uh, this was just a collection of things that were made for some other reason. And we're not sure why. Uh, materials included uh, in this example are a watch face, paper that's been drawn on, bottle caps, and of course all that wrapped up in wire. Uh, really interesting artwork. And the fact that it's anonymous makes it, in a way, seem even more valuable. In Mexico, it's common to see uh, this type of artwork is called a retablo. And the idea behind the artwork is that uh, it's done as a form of thanks. Uh, so if something miraculous happened to you, uh, for example, this piece we're told by the textbook uh, was done by a person who had been accused of murder and then was found innocent. So the artwork was to commemorate that uh, and to give thanks for that event. Again, it's not done by a trained artist, and it's not done with the intent of exhibiting it in a museum or having it uh, to be appreciated as art. It's done for different reasons, which are very personal, and uh, that would fall into that category of outsider art as opposed to someone who's academically trained. One way to describe artwork or the way it functions is to talk about its relationship to reality. Uh, so. What's artwork compared to what's real, and how do you describe that connection? In a lot of artwork, there is a connection uh, to reality, and we call that representational artwork. So if you have a piece of art that represents, in a way, something else, whether that be um, a very realistic-looking visual copy of something, or uh, if the appearance of something has been changed for some reason. Uh, we refer to that as representational art. So representational art represents something visually. Something that's always a good challenge for an artist is to depict something realistically, uh, like a photograph. And painters, long before photography was invented, challenged themselves to do this. Um, that includes simulating textures, uh, because we're looking at a painting, of course, it's flat and it doesn't have any real texture, but um, the idea of light striking an object and wrapping around it, creating shadows and highlights, and then treating textures in certain visual ways uh, is something that painters enjoy challenging themselves to copy. This also inspired a surrealist painter named uh, René Magritte when he painted this piece, uh, and the title of it is This Is Not a Pipe. And what he was doing was making a commentary about the relationship between art and reality. So just because something looks very much like something else, 
uh, that doesn't necessarily make it that thing. Artists influence each other throughout history, of course, and then the piece was copied again uh, by another artist who stitched together uh, dollar bills uh, with the title that this is definitely not a pipe. Again, making a commentary about the relationship between realist objects and, and paintings. Also, in that case, making a commentary about art as a valuable commodity. Uh, as you know, there are artworks that are being sold for millions of dollars, and so it's a, a thriving marketplace where collectors swap things back and forth and buy and sell. Uh, so artists will sometimes make a commentary on that as well. If artwork departs from the visual appearance uh, of a subject, it's still considered representational, even though in some cases it, it might appear very strange, it is considered a representational artwork. Um, this is common in design. So if you have a motif which involves uh, natural forms or human figures, sometimes those are abstracted to fit within a certain space, or it could be abstracted in order to uh, express something about the artist's idea uh, of humanity. Anyway, remember that abstract art is representational, but the realistic appearance of things is altered or changed. The following series by artist Theo Van Doesburg uh, shows a interesting idea about abstraction. So as you can tell, the original drawing starts off as a very uh, photorealistic looking drawing of a cow. Then uh, the cow seems to be divided up progressively into geometric forms until at the end, after color is applied, uh, it becomes completely abstract. Now the piece that's at the end is still representational because we know where it comes from. We, we realize that it still represents uh, the same natural object. If you just viewed that piece by itself, you might have a different idea about it. Uh, you might see it as being a non-representational piece or a piece that doesn't have a visual reference in the real world. So unlike Representational art, non-representational art, does not have an external visual reference. Uh, what that means that if you're looking at a piece that's non-representational, let's say, for example, a painting, uh, you may find yourself thinking that it looks like a house or a tree or a person. But if it's a non-representational painting, then any such likeness is just coincidence. Um, that came from somewhere else because the painting itself is not based on that visual subject. A great example of a non-representational painting would be Autumn Rhythm uh, by a painter named Jackson Pollock. Now, Jackson Pollock in the 1950s was a super famous artist, and nowadays we don't think of uh, visual artists as being that famous, uh, but he was every much as bit as famous as, uh, as an athlete uh, or a singer or an actor would be today. One reason he was so famous was because he had this unconventional style. He was labeled by a critic as being Jack the Dripper because uh, the critic was insulting the way that he was painting. The result of this style is very energetic uh, and are actually quite beautiful pieces, but it is non-representational. So if you look at Autumn Rhythm, uh, you may think to yourself that you see a forest or, or you see something that looks like a tree, um, but it's not meant to represent that visual subject. Uh, it's more about the idea of movement, um, and it does have a, a certain amount of energy to it. Another great example of non-representational art uh, is this piece called Her Secret is Patience. This is a very large sculpture located in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and it's about 100 feet tall. Make sure that you click on the link uh, for a really good YouTube video about this piece. We can discuss a piece of artwork in terms of its form or its content or both. Form in a piece of artwork refers to its visual qualities. 
So if you were discussing the form of a painting, you might be talking about the lines that we can see that are used, uh, the use of color, if is the paint thin or thick? Uh, what's the actual texture of it? What, what's it painted on? Is it on a canvas? Is it on a piece of wood? How does it visually appear? That would be the form of the piece. A great example of the difference between form and content uh, are these two pieces. They're done in different centuries. They're both carved out of stone, so we'd say that they utilize the same medium. The form of the pieces is very different. Uh, as you can tell, the first sculpture is depicts very realistic looking humans, and the second sculpture, those humans have been abstracted and turned more into uh, simplified geometric forms. They have very different form, but we would say that they have very similar content. Uh, both of these pieces are about a human embrace. A uh, human embrace looks very different when interpreted by these two different artists, but um, it still has a similar content. So the form is its visual appearance. The content uh, is its possible message or meaning. On Wednesday in class, we talked a little bit about the idea of iconography, and iconography centers around the word icon, and it's communicating using uh, certain subjects or symbols uh, that have a definite meaning attached to them. Uh, a lot of times you see this type of idea used in religious artwork. Uh, for example, these paintings are referred to as religious icons, and they're not just decorations. They're actually used as an introduction to prayer. So if your patron saint of your family, for example, is St. Christopher, you might open your prayer to that saint uh, by concentrating on that painting, using it as an icon. When we look at artwork throughout history, if we have some context or some information from that specific time period, we can learn a lot more about the iconography or about the symbolism that appears in different pieces. And sometimes that's very specific to a certain region or a certain religion uh, or even a certain political movement. And when we're talking about different religions, we have very different forms of iconography. Uh, for example, there's a, a big difference, as you can see, between Christian iconography or uh, iconography that might come from a piece of Buddhist artwork. Sometimes iconography is not so obvious to spot, and it's possible that in this painting by Vincent van Gogh that the sowing of the seeds uh, is meant to be an icon, is meant to represent uh, some other concept or idea, the idea of the sower. Besides art, another term that's difficult to define sometimes is creativity. So the textbook attempts to define it uh, by to bring forth something new that has value. So being creative doesn't necessarily just involve making something new. It's something new that has value. And as you may know, uh, the value is sometimes very much in question. And if we look at the history of art, we can see over and over again how artworks uh, become questioned as far as their value goes. A lot of times artwork is either seen as being a, a work of genius or it's seen as being uh, something that has absolutely no value at all. And so that's sometimes depending on who's looking at it. A question about the value of an artwork uh, was involved with this piece. It's by... Mexican muralist painter named Diego Rivera, and Diego Rivera was uh, world famous for doing these very large scale works. So this is a, a fresco painting, which is a type of paint medium on a wall, and it's at a massive scale. He was hired uh, to put the piece into uh, the Rockefeller Center, and it was going to be a, a piece of artwork that was seen by many, many people every day and it was going to become actually physically part of the building. Diego Rivera was a communist. He was actually a card-carrying member of the Communist Party, and at the time in the United States, that was very unpopular. Uh, so when he completed the piece, and it contained images of people like uh, Joseph Stalin and Karl Marx, uh, and that idea of all these different people collaborating, which reminded people of communism, um, it upset a lot of people, including the Rockefellers, who 
actually ended up having the piece destroyed. It was broken up uh, with sledgehammers and carried out. The photograph that you're looking at uh, is a photograph of a different version of the painting that uh, Diego completed. And the original was replaced uh, with the next slide, which became about um, the completion of the American Railroad, included a, an image of Abraham Lincoln. There's also a link that's included that's really good um, about Diego Rivera, and in particular, uh, this piece of artwork that you should watch. Um, read chapter one if you haven't done it yet. It'd be a really good idea. Uh, and then I'll see you on Monday. There used to be cool outro music right here, like there was intro music at the beginning, but YouTube uh, flagged me for a content violation, and it made him take down my video, so I took out the music. Have a good weekend.